Uh, kia ora no tātou, uh, tātou i tai mai, i ngā hau e whā, uh, tēnā tātou, uh, nei rā te reo mihi o kaitahu kā te māmoi waitaha hoki, he uri a hau o tahu pōtiki, te roa hiki hiki, kai tauka, puki kura mauka, matau awa, he mihi atu nei, uh, i te taha toku karaua, Ko nga te rui nui, te ati awa, taranaki iwi hoki. A te nga koutou, nō reira, te nga koutou, te nga koutou, te nga tātou katoa. Um, kia ora, my name is Matt Matahaere. Um, I come from a little village just down the road here in uh, Otipoti, Koro Tākau. Um, on my taua, on my grandmother's side, we're Kaitahu Kātu Māmoi Waitaha. And on my grandfather's side, he we fuck a papa into Taranaki. So, Nati Ronui, Tiati Awa, Taranaki Iwi. With all that, we actually, I actually grew up in Invercargill. So, I grew up in Muri Hiku. Um, lived there for my younger childhood years. And moved here back, I guess what you'd call coming back home when mum went to uh, university as a first year student, we come back here. Um, I loved it. So I come here and it was like the big smoke. So it's coming from Invis, where everybody knows your name, to coming up here, so, and I loved it. Um, I went to Logan Park, which is just down the road. I know Jen's got a daughter there at Logan Park, so. Loved that school, used to rule the school. I thought I did, but I probably actually didn't. Um, I had quite what you would call a fractured relationship with education. Um, I always thought I knew everything. Um, I guess probably that was one of my problems. Um, I went to school because I'm a very sociable person. I uh, love being around people. I'm not shy, I've never been shy. So I like talking to people, I love human interaction. Um, and I, when I went to school, I it felt like school was a prison. So we used to go there, you'd have to sit in your chair, teacher would spew stuff at you, and the role of us was just to regurgitate what they were telling us. And I always used to say to my teachers, I always used to say, the stuff that we're learning in history had no relevance to me, so I couldn't make sense of things that didn't reflect my context. And I used to ask them that, and I used to ask them why are we not learning about the history of this area, uh, the names and places, and I used to get kicked out of class all the time. And so I had an amazing teacher, an English teacher, so I used to just go and sit in her class because she'd just let me come and sit in there and do my work. So as soon as I turned 16, I was gone. So I left it. I was really gutted, and I remember my mother, who's always been engaged in education, she was really gutted, but I just wasn't having a good time. So I understood at an early age, before I, before I found Paulo Freire, the idea of circular teaching and learning, and I was asking this. It wasn't until I was years later at uni I felt vindicated a little bit, but... Um, Left school at 16, rolled around Dunedin thinking I was cool, doing everything that young Māori males did. Getting drunk all the time, smoking marijuana, just doing whatever. And I remember being, and it was really funny, and I tell you this because I feel like you just need to understand my context. And I remember sitting in a flat, and I looked around at everyone, and we just watched this movie. Can't remember what it was, but it was set in Italy. And then we were thinking, I want to go there. Like it looked amazing. And I thought, man, I want to go there. And I looked I really, and I was thinking about this the other day. I looked around my mates and I thought, wow, there's got to be more life than this context here, right? So I thought, man, I'm out. So I uh, hooked up with a local community organisation, um, did some just labouring work and got a little bit of money. And then I used to sit at... By then, Mum was kind of third year university. She used to read us her essays, and I'm always been about everything's a competition for me, right? So I've always been a sore winner, never been a sore loser, never been a sore loser, always been a sore winner. So 
Mum used to read us these essays and lectures and that, and I used to be really gutted because I didn't understand the words she was using. So she used words like Marxism, socialism, colonialism, imperialism, all these isms. So what I used to do was, she read this out to me and I didn't know what she was saying. I used to sit up at night and grab her readers and read her readings with a dictionary. And you would know, being educators, that you read a dictionary, it doesn't really give you the answer for things. And I used to ask mum, I used to say, mum, what does colonialism mean? She used to be, say to me, what do you think it means? And I'm like, mate, just give me the, for dummies. So I thought in my head, I want to travel, I want to do things in life, and to do these things, you have to have money. This is just a simple thing in this society we grew up in. So I thought, right, I'm going to uni. I want to be able to understand what mum's talking about. So I went to uni as an adult learner at 20, had to relearn everything. So essays, had to learn how to write paragraphs, how to read readings. Um, and I remember sitting in my first year polls class and they were talking about the Cold War and I was like, what is everyone talking about? I was looking around the classroom and everyone was like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I didn't know what they were talking about. But once again, that idea that everything's a competition, I had to know. So ended up with a uh, double major in anthropology and political studies. And when you do political studies, you always... The trajectory for you is to go to MFAT, because that's what they told us we did. You go and become a diplomat. So just before we were going to do interviews with MFAT, I went to a public lecture from Mason Jury in the town hall. And you know, you're young, you just want to make all this change. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, when's this going to be finished? I thought this dude was a man, right? That's what I thought in my head. And I'm just sort of in and out listening. And then he said one thing. He says... If you want to make real change, real change occurs at the community level. And I was stunned because it threw me. I thought in my head, how am I going to do that in Wellington if I even get a role with them fat? So I went and worked for an NGO for like 10 years. They don't, one thing they don't tell you about work, working for an NGO is that you don't make much money. <laughs> Most NGOs run off the smell of an oily rag. They work off the commitment of the people that are working there. And then I did a few secondments in the community, um, done some work in the public sector, come to the university because I wanted to understand the tertiary sector more and I was looking for some change. Initially I thought oh, I'll be here for a couple of years. I've been here for seven years now, so... Um, yeah, so that's kind of my history and, and the reason why I tell you this is because, especially in Te Ao Māori, Whakawhanaungatanga, it's really good for you to understand where I'm coming from, because I could be coming from Mars, but you just wouldn't know, so I had to tell you where I come from. So, um, kia ora. Um, I chose this topic because in the last sort of, well, pretty much throughout my whole life, I've always wanted to know why. I always have to know things. And I always loved the names and their attachments and how they were attached to the land of whenua. So... When this opportunity come up, I thought, man, I'll do it. And then as it got closer, I was like, why did I want to do that, you know? <laughs> but hey, is it, it is what it is. Also, look, I have to acknowledge a, a number of people who have inspired me in my career. Uh, initially, it's my mother, um, who has just been amazing for me, has always been that role model. I've always wanted to be mum you know, and never will be mum. She's a woman. And um, secondly, she's very smart. So I've always wanted to mirror her and follow her in her career. Another key person for me was Tahu Portiki. So when I met Tahu, I didn't know he was like the man. He was just really nice to me. And I was a young child, very impressionable. He wasn't that much older than me, really, when I think about it, but he was very nice and he enabled me to be who I wanted to be. Some people can't find me quite full on. Tahu, just let me be, you know. And So I have always wanted to follow Tahu and his mahi. Um, obviously my whanau, people like Dr. Tamaiti Tau, who's from Tuahiwi and at 
Ōtautahi in Christchurch. So these are the people, the people from my hapū, my whanauka sitting down here. These are the people that inspire me to want to carry on our, our rich tradition. Right. I love this picture here, right? So this is Mua'upoko, which is like the peninsula. It's a beautiful picture here. And when I'm driving to Otaka, I go over the top road. I just love looking at this image here and I always think to myself, be pretty buzzy what, to think what this looked like 150 years ago, right? It was totally different. In 1827, the French botanist, the navigator, Captain Dumont de Ville, visited New Zealand in his ship, the Astrolabe. When visiting the northern coastline of Te Waiponamu, he noted, and I quote, there is not an islet, a rock, a corner of the land without a name. For Kaitahu and other iwi, we have a name for every part and fabric that make up the whenua, the seas, the rivers, the lakes, our highways. The names vary. Some are literal, practical, and explain the history of the area. Some are an omen for future generations. There are tūpuna or whakapapa names. This is direct and tells you who holds mana in this area. This attachment is inscribed through whakapapa, the stories and narratives passed down to generations and the names we hear, we see, and carry today a reflection of the history of this area. The most beautiful and wonderful names that roll off the tongue so smooth. But names with deeper meaning if you know the history of the people of this area and with the name, you start to unwrap its significance. And with this, the relationship it has with the whenua. For example, I'll use something we all know, should know. If we were in Johannesburg, South Africa, and someone said, see that place there? It's called Mandela. Would we just say, yeah, cool? No, I don't think we would. Mandela. You would start to think of his life, his imprisonment under the brutal, brutal system of apartheid. With this, you would understand its significance to place, space, and why a name is more than words on a map, both Google and paper, or a destination. So, what of the original names that spoke of and to the whenua? We need to go back and look at the conditions that created what we have today. It is simple. I was talking to the tech guys and they were saying, you can't get this wrong. <laughs> Te Horopaki. Horopaki is just context, so the context. I love this picture here. It's, um, if you're ripping on Google, well, I just found it on Google, and it's all taco in the 1800s. So bringing in, looks like a feed of kai, probably alfanonga, bringing in some kai for the whanau. I love this picture. The process of colonialism and all its brutality not only actively displaced indigenous peoples throughout Te Ika Ao Maui and Te Waiponamu, but it knew that for this to have long-lasting effects, it had to dismantle our institutions. Te Reo Māori, our tikanga and kawa had to be eradicated because it is these po that can explain what it is to be Māori. Te reo Māori is the language. Tikanga is the process or the way we do things. And kawa is a set, a set of rules that guide us. This is fixed, unlike tikanga, which can be more fluid and move with the times. Now, an example of that is COVID, level four, right? So with our tangihana, our funerals, we weren't able to practice our traditional ways of burying our dead and seeing them off. Much has been written about the Native Schools Act 1867. 
This was forced assimilation conducted entirely in English, and besides teaching the very basics of reading and writing, it was geared more towards teaching us manual labour. You know the corridor. We can sing, dance, and we're only good with our hands. Systemic teaching of civility to a system that is always for them, never us. Interesting, when the idea of partnership is a key principle of the treaty, a document that was meant to acknowledge the mana of Māori and the right for tino rangatiratanga, self-determination. Does this sound like a partnership? Not really, this sounds like a dysfunctional relationship and I'm sure if there are social workers in attendance, I wonder how does this look like on the power and control wheel? I don't want to spend too much time on the deficits here because these are widely known. However, it would be remiss of me not to explain what is blindingly obvious to us, and that is colonialism as a system in this country has looked to break down what it is to be Māori and rebuild us to be of service as a colonial construct. The issue with the well-oiled system like colonialism is that it is never just a point in time. Rather, colonialism has to be constantly, has to constantly reproduce itself in order to reinforce the public's acquiescence. Think anniversaries, which only serve to celebrate the greatness of colonial history, barely little or no mention of the 400 years of previous occupation. In his seminal work, Prison Notebooks, the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci called this hegemony. The idea that institutions play a role in reinforcing the status quo is critical when we look at the inequities that exist today. So how do names become transcribed onto the whenua? I love it, what's in a name? For any Shakespeare, right? That's where it comes from, right? It's stole it, really. Well, it's actually a nod to Shakespeare. The concept of mana whenua is the framework for which we can understand how a place or something gets its name. Put simply, mana whenua are the people who have authority over the land or area. It's very specific. The principles that underpin this concept are as follows. Take tupuna, a right which can be established through an ancestor. Umu takata, rights through conquest. And tapa tapa, the naming of something, and in this context, specifically through discovery of land or resource. This is best exemplified in the pepiha, he puna hayatu, he puna waimarie, he puna karikari. The pools of frozen water, the pools of bounty, the pools dug by the hands of man. Now I have a little bit of an issue with the hands of man because I'm just wondering were women doing nothing back then, but hey. <laughs> and look, this is really a brag and it's to say that we've been here since the footsteps of Rakai Hotu. And Rakai Hotu is a wai was Waitaha and is a common ancestor of the people of Kaitahu and Kati Mamwe. A look around this area, you will see the names, you will see that the names speak of the earliest and the first inhabitants. Otako speaks of a channel that runs in the Moana directly opposite where Otako Marae sits now. The name now has taken on as a signifier of the rohi or the area. Te tai o Arai Te Uru, the Otago coastal marine area which takes its name from the Arai Te Uru Waka that capsized transporting Kumara, its navigators on board whose names are remembered on our landmarks around Dunedin. The name for St. Clair is my favourite, Whakahekido. She was a Waitaha woman from a prominent whānau and she was the wife of Tu Wiriroa who was a prominent Kati Mamoi chief who had pa or homes at Taiari Mouth and in Tahuna, Queenstown. 
Fakadi for Wakadi, just up the road here. With the death of a prominent chief, they held his body up for the people to see that he was dead, to hold up and elevate his Fakadi. Teo for Roslyn, which is another suburb just up here. I mean, O is fog or mist, so Teo is the fog or the mist. And if you think back in the years, it would have been a place of dense bush and forest with walking tracks, and we can understand the meaning for its name. These are merely just a few examples of the names in this area. If mana whenua is the framework that can articulate the process of names and naming something, then the overriding institution that governs this is whakapapa. I love this picture here. So this is a picture of my uh, tūpuna. This is uh, Wi Portiki, who was uh, one of the chiefs from Otako, and this is his son, uh, Ihaya Portiki, uh, who lived down at Kaka Point. Whakapapa, or genealogy, is a guiding principle in te ao Māori. Whakapapa, as explained by Ta Apirana Ngata in Te Māori Tau's Ngā Piki Tūroa o Ngaitahu, the oral traditions of Ngaitahu, says it is the process of laying one thing upon another. Building foundations, and for anyone who studied archaeology, this would look like stratification. I must admit that as an anthro major, a prereq was taking 100 level archaeology papers and it just did not hit home with me. But I'll be honest with you, over five years, the only thing I remember from archaeology is stratification. <laughs> I'm actually quite stunned I passed. Whakapapa is what binds us to one another. And as we look back, we look at how does the many Fano have held mana for us in this area? When I speak of mana, I have to acknowledge that everyone has mana. When we subscribe to the notion of kanohi ki te kanohi, takata ki te, ki te takata, face to face, eye to eye, so we are on the same level. There's actually an amazing TED talk by Tamaiti who talks about this very concept. When you systematically erase the original, the original names of places, you are consciously or unconsciously doing this in an effort to rewrite history as if we have never existed. It's like the old saying, if you tell a lie so many times, over the years it becomes a truth. This coupled with generations of not teaching the history of this country in compulsory education, we are left with something where we are fighting, feel like we are fighting to the death to bring our names back into the public domain. Because we will not sit by and watch as our names, beautiful names, are never acknowledged or spoken about at all. The world is a much different place now. We have a generation of young people who refuse to accept what they have been told. High rents, cut out of a housing market, continuous assaults on the female body, hypermasculinity. No, there is a power in the whenua, and it is this generation who will, to use a beautiful kaitahu whakatoki, haia te awa, slash the sea from the sky and blaze a pathway forward. In conclusion, Whakamutunga, I've got it down here but I haven't got it on a slide, I'll just leave my beautiful tūpuna up there. I have, I guess what you'd call a number of takeaways, but really you can take away whatever you want. These are just some for you to think about. And that is, learn the history of this country if you don't know it, and specifically the area you live and work in. Find out the names. And as always, there are narratives attached to these names. Bring in local people to talk about this. Who are the mana whenua in your area that hold this mātauranga, this knowledge? Make these connections. 
it is always about whaka whanaungatanga, relationships, meaningful relationships that will grow to be of mutual benefit. This will only add value to your mahi, mahi work in the outdoor space because, like I said in the beginning, the seas, rivers and lakes are our highways. There is a whole depth of knowledge that will complement your mahi. It's also about understanding your role and obligations under the treaty. Now, I don't know if this is the old Marxist to me, but um, <laughs> the last point, really. What we need is a sy systematic overhaul of the current education system and the way that we teach people. We need to rethink how we engage in education so that it becomes a circular process. We don't lack the answers, we actually know what we have to do. What we lack is the courage to act. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.